uh, Sean Chittenden, work at, at Joint in Engineering. Um, in prior lives, uh, I've done FreeBSD. Um, I come with orange colors today, uh, and for all intents and purposes, I, instead of speaking for the trees as the Lorax, I'm here to speak for the users um, and people that are on kind of small software islands because uh, we share a lot of that in common. So things that are kind of required and or for the understanding, and this is largely for slideware for people that are going to view this stuff in the future. Um, you don't need a whole lot. Packers by and large it and uh, some form of source control. So I'm going to go through kind of a, a small odyssey talking about uh, two particular packages that exist on the internet. Uh, and because it's on the internet, it must be right. We've got Go Core Utils and Rust Core Utils. Go through the installation of that and some things that kind of come out of the woodwork when you go in and attempt to replace and dark around with um, new user lands. Um, and it's interesting kind of going through these, this exercise because it turns out that uh, distributions and operating systems have been wrangling with this problem for a while. And, and there's a bunch of double standards that you kind of run into. So what is an operating system? Okay. Like really kind of philosophical to begin with, like what is it? Is it a kernel? Is it a user land? Uh, there are all of these things, like when you, you say like what is FreeBSD to you or to your organization, it means different things based off of the context and the perspective that you bring to this piece of software that you use, right? It's a large ball of software, but the thing that stands out and is important to you is different based off of you and your organization. So, uh, you know, at a lot, there's times where I've really cared about the FreeBSD kernel. There's times where I've really cared about uh, the FreeBSD user land. There's other times I really care about the community and kind of the ethos of correctness um, and the community, right? A lot of us trek here, for instance, die a lot because of the community. Uh, and there's a lot to just an operating system. It's not one thing necessarily. If you care about the kernel, right, step back again, right? If you and we have a couple of these people. If we are, if we, um, are working at a CDN company because you like to chuck bits, then the kernel kind of is everything, right? The kernel is your competitive advantage. That's the reason that a lot of CDNs use BSD and not Linux, right? So that's kind of it. You're chucking bits, and it's about network throughput and the ability to get to the metal and, and you know send something out reliably. If you're an appliance vendor, you have a di totally different perspective. Right? The license is by and large everything. You're, you're, you're potentially contributing back, hopefully, um, but by and large you have a need to go in and participate in a larger ecosystem for monetary benefit because you're taking source code, making it proprietary on embedded device, and shipping it as a thing. So, and, and by and large, if you're doing an appliance, you have complete control. It's got a little slow life cycle. You've got a four-year life to the thing that you kick out the door. So user land is not that important for you in that case, right? It is the kernel, again, right? That, that's really what you're kind of after. And maybe you put some proprietary bits on top of that, but embedded, right? Even more stripped down. Yeah, it's, it's again, it's about the kernel, right? Nobody cares about user land in an embedded system. Hosting providers? Yeah, you care about the kernel because you need containment, right? But you don't necessarily care um, as much about you know, some of the other things, but you, you, it's definitely important, right? So yes. network. Yeah, we care about network security, right? We've got three firewalls, after all. Uh, or maybe four, I don't know. Uh, there's something probably kicking around in NetMap. Um, so then users, right? If you're just a consumer of user, like you're TrueOS or somebody else like that, you do it because you want stability, and that's kind of the extent of your association and relationship with the kernel, OK? And if you're an operator, yeah, this is, like, this is, this is what you develop muscle memory around be when you go to go and fight fire or do something, right? You need to know that you can pull these handful of levers and be productive and be effective. So as an operator, you, know, you also care, you care about the kernel, but you care about it because of the workflow that, that the kernel lets you kind of like impose on, or the, the, you care because it changes the way that you go and solve a problem. And if you're a developer, which, you know, developer summer, um, you, know, you care because like there's, that this is what you work on, right? You're kind of compelled to care because it's what we're developing. And if you're a manager, do you care about the kernel? Maybe, maybe not. If, if you don't care about the, the, like, maybe, why would you care about the kernel, right? There's, there's maybe a long-term benefit, and that's why you care, because there's better uptime. Okay, fine, that's maybe the reason why management would. But generally speaking, yes, we do care, right? So, okay, user land addition. Okay, CDNs, do you really care about it? No, right, so this is the inverse of the kernel. No, no, no. Hosting providers? Yeah, actually, this one's 
you care because familiarity is important, right? This is friction for users. Everybody who's heard me speak in any capacity has heard me bring up friction, friction and I'm going to keep hammering on that because that's important, right? That muscle memory, that familiarity, the lack of, of the need to go and train somebody is incredibly important. Because that friction, and you know, I'm on an island right now uh, with, with Lumos, you don't want to have to go and train people if you can avoid it. It's really, really important to have that first touch experience be low friction. Okay. Security deployment, yeah, fine. Like you've got Nessus and whatever else that you depend on. Users, yeah, like this is this is what I'm getting like hosting providers, users, like all of a sudden these two kind of worlds converge. And you know what? If you go and drop onto a box and your your muscle memory says top and you don't get it, then you're hosed and you have to remember things like this. And it's not hard, it's the same kind of data and information, but that friction is adds up to something, right? There's a tax there. So operators, yeah, you care. Right? Because, again, this is what you develop your muscle memory and your scripting around because your interface for doing management is the user land. So you care there. If you're a developer, yeah, sure. Right. Um, but again, management, productivity. Yes? No? Maybe? I don't know. So we're going to go and consult an Oracle, and we're going to ask it because, like, you know, we're in this computer science field, and, and clearly an eight ball is the right way to go and solve this answer. And you know what? It's kind of fuzzy. We really don't, like, from, from, from the perspective of users, is the kernel that important? Yeah, kind of, right? KDebian, right? Gen 2 FreeBSD, is it really important? Kind of, maybe, maybe not. So, user land, it's like, at this point in time, most of our incoming, you know, recruits, people that work on the BSD, ecosystem, user land, whatever else, are being trained in different operating systems. And that familiarity is really important because if the first thing that you need to figure out in order to get your job done is some new flavor and variant, that's friction that, that's going to take you a, an increase the amount of time that it takes for you to get something done. There may be a period of time in the future where you're going to see some return on investment because of, of the, the ecosystem that you opted into. but. Great. And a lot of us here, obviously, have already gone through that. But you know what? If, if your incoming class of everything, HR or otherwise, is Linux admin, and you say, hey, we want it to you know, put something in front of you, their response is going to be this, and your response is going to be, we're going to have to un uh, you're going to have to unlearn all of your random Linuxisms, right? And as you hire people, and I'm sure people here have, then this becomes kind of a chronic thing where you're like, okay, we're going to have to like, you know, kind of unbrainwash and reteach and whatever else. So user land is really important. And then user land, like the next kind of like above the base, like base built-in utilities, you have the op applications, right? So ports, right? So do CDNs care? No. They, they, they care up to the point because Nginx and Varnish is something, for instance, that is developed outside of the CDNs themselves. They just leverage this package. They expect that to work well. Right? And so that's important to their business. So yeah, they kind of do actually care, right? They, they, they care in the sense that like network bits is really what is, is what the, being able to ship bits quickly and efficiently is a competitive advantage. But if they have to go and build the entire stack, then it, that competitive advantage comes with an additional cost and they really want to be able to leverage existing software. Okay, so yeah, partially. Appliance vendors, no. They have BSD license, they strip everything to the bone. Uh, embedded systems, definitely not. Hosting providers, yeah, right? Users that go and sign up for things, that go and, and have some itch they want to scratch, um, they just want to do a package install, right? Uh, I would be really interested in stats and of, of the growth and use of FreeBSD as it transitioned from ports to packages, right? There's probably an interesting graph there uh, in terms of adoption and usage. Uh, I would like to know what that is. Network security deployment, sure, yeah. You want to be able to just go in and, and like get to the value add of whatever it is that a program is, offers you, Wireshark, TCP dump, whatever. Users, they just want to be able to do stuff, right? So, okay, great. Operators, and uh, yeah. So, and again, at the end of the day, like, you know, is there a cost, is there a tax to doing some of this stuff? Who knows? And again, consult the Oracle, the dupe side. Uh, 
you go. So from release, so I'm going to skip through some of this. So release engineering, though, right? So like when you, you use our operating system, actually, there's value to the release engineering process because that gives you some stability. There's kind of like an implicit contract between you, the user, consumer of, of, an, of the, the distribution of the operating system, and the, oper the project itself that's publishing these releases. And th there's like... There is an enormous amount of value to the ABI stability, for instance, that is enforced in the way that we go and develop software in the project. And that's a value, right? And who cares about that? It really kind of depends. Um, you know, people that have long life cycles, they don't care about the, the, the upgradability or some of these things because they've, you know, packaged things off. So, you know, it, it's a mixed bag again, right? And then distribution, yeah. So, great. So now, like, popping back, popping stack from kind of the philosophical element of some of this stuff, or kind of like the practical realities of it, and getting into the actual implementation, what does it look like? How do you do this, right? Um, I'm sure many of us have hacked up release to go and build our own images. There's tools to go and do this that make this extremely easy, that allow for experimentation, um, that allow you to customize this stuff. And the friction of d producing a brand new release is getting frighteningly low. So, in this particular case, checking out a repo, I'm going to push, push on all of the content here. Um, run through a couple of utilities here, make sure env chain, I'm going to keep stumping that for a while so that people don't put secrets and environment variables um, uh, in their profile. Um, in this case, I've got a wrapper make file that's going to call the packer utility, that's going to build an image using userland go and it's going to connect and do all this because this is the fastest way for me to go and iterate on this, but I could have done this in VMs. Um, so great, so it's going to read this manifest file or template file to go and create it, a spit, pull down a FreeBSD 9 Im uh, 11 image, nine, that's gonna date me. Um, and then it's going to you know, spit out a pile of output and then run through a series of, of scripts so that I can create kind of a golden master image that I can begin to reuse and then experiment with and figure out what, what, it, what it looks like to have a, you know, modified user land. Okay, so great, goes through, downloads, in this case it installed Go, Go then goes and went and checked out the Go core utils. Um, and then installed all the Go core utils into, in this case, I, I installed them into the right locations as right as I could do, like M MD5 sum became MD5, and like just did the offensive thing and, and clobbered what was there, okay? Like how do you make this kind of a first class like thing potentially, and what does it look like when we do this, right? There's a fair amount of, of the user land utilities that were re-implemented. Re These are all in Go, so they're all static binaries. Um, they generally work, it's cross-platform, this is interesting. I'm gonna come back to this in a minute. And what do you think, right? I was like, okay, so I've done this, gone through the exercise, it was kind of interesting to go and figure out what it meant to go and use, you know, a non-C user land. And uh, it pretty much failed, uh, miserably. Uh, a lot of the things that are in our base system, right? When I went to go and run just like locate DB, runs off and runs a handful of things, doesn't work so well, right? Because you know what? For whatever reason, this particular binary doesn't support dash 128. Like it, this wanted to go and find, um, it was literally like head dash 128 and it didn't support a naked number. So interesting. So you can't just, you know, drop things onto the file system. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Um, so that obviously didn't work, but there are other utilities here, and some of these work really well, and some of them actually are multi-threaded, and there's some anecdotal evidence that I didn't benchmark, I wish I would have, um, and I may hear this evening, is that some of the Go utilities outperform our C utilities because they're multi-threaded, right? So our appetite as a project for threaded base utilities is pretty small. Right? We have a couple of instances of it. I'm not sure where actually we do that, but in the Go world and other programming languages that make threading and concurrency a first-class citizen, no problem, do it. Right? So this is what initially led me down this path was like, how do I introduce modern tooling and modern languages to an existing system? Okay. So that failed. So, but interesting, right? Like it, like I, I ended up playing around with this for a couple days and it works okay, right? As long as you don't use a lot of switches that you're used to. And you go, damn it. So it needs to bake more. 
some of the stuff's kind of shoddy. Um, and for all intents and purposes, because of the GPL v3, this particular author, and I'm not picking on it, like I think it just needs time to bake, um, or they moved on, fine. I didn't see anybody contributing to it. Interesting. Um, there's no incentive for this person to go and kind of like, you know, figure out all the rough edges, because there's no hope that it's ever going to get used in anything potentially other than Linux. Not that that's a small community, but, um, you know, there's definitely a gap. I think that's part of why a lot of us self-select into the BSDs. There's a gap in quality and or like shared values and understanding that uh, would prevent this code from getting to the level of maturation um, that, you know, for instance, we would require if the license were different. So, okay, so that's a failed experiment. Take two, right? Or, or part two, like what is progress, right? So, BSD as a project is, is you know, it's a piece of software, but it's got kind of an interesting history in terms of learning. And if you look at other sciences, right, like, this isn't something that's terribly, we don't debate this too often, uh, in the sense that, like, there's been a bunch of research, you, you don't, you know, in this case, I, I, I picked on uh, corporal punishment, bunch of research, you don't beat your kids, right? Like, you, like, we've learned that, like, the, like corporal punishment as a way of, of teaching kids is not appropriate. Maybe feel nice, but like there's a bunch of research that says this is not okay. Okay, so if you were coming from like you know an area when software thought that this was okay, maybe if if uh, the, the APA has advanced and done enough research to figure out that this is not okay, then maybe we can like you know similarly have some research, get some understanding, and move on to like you know some modern workflows, modern practices. Because if you do this, you're going to end up with a kid with with kids that have Stockholm syndrome, and you're you're mm, hey, we're going to come back to that too. So software, right? Have we learned? Yeah, we know how to learn as long as we can measure it, right? So in this case, this was a performance regression. Great, like, kudos to figuring this out. Like, this was an observable thing. There was a regression, it was a bug. We, we know how to solve performance problems, okay? We, as a community, however, have no idea how to solve a usability problem. We have no way of, of, of quantifying what usability is, right? So we're really good about debugging, really good about performance, and have no idea about usability. It's muscle memory. So there, therefore, there is no usability to this. I mean, like, this one is one of my favorites. Who's done this before? You type diff, and you forget the dash u flag, and you're like, motherfucker, I never read diff without dash u. Who does? Anybody? Like, <laughs> on accident or purpose? <laughs> Sometimes both, okay. But look, it's 2017, right? Like, we know how to do this a little bit better. It's not perfect, but like, diff dash u, why isn't that the default at this point? Right? I bet you the amount of things that would break as a result of this needs to be small. Because anything that actually cares and has tight coupling with this particular program is going to use all of the right flags in order to get the exact behavior. But the default why can't this be user friendly or dash u in the TTY? Nobody cares, and no, everybody's by and large afraid to touch this chunk of history because you know what? We may not agree. Oh, this was a great quote from yesterday. We may not agree on much, but we can at least agree on history. This is how it was in the past. Yes, we don't necessarily agree that this is the right thing today, right? It's useless today, but what do you make of these four tools I use? We can fix those. <laughs> And then everybody else benefits. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I'd be interested in hearing more. <laughs> but I'm going to come back to this, <laughs> some of this stuff. So like, could we have learned, right? So over the course of very long and storied history, right? And when I say very long, this is like Star Wars intro credits long. Because lots has happened, and this doesn't even include, uh, I mean, this is just the, B this is very specific to the BSDs, right? Like, I, I know that I am working on an operating system right now that is not represented here. And it has its own interesting history. Right? Which I am in the process of trying to finalize the divorce from, and it's not going very well. You would think it would. So, uh, date, here we go. 1965, 1969, that's when this stuff, you know, kind of like the genesis of some of this stuff. Okay, great. So in, you know, how long? How long has it been? 
we're still using some of the same outmoded concepts because our way of evaluating this software from then hasn't changed because we have no way of, of, of either no appetite for changing it or no appetite or way of measuring it to say, you know what, the usability is not great. So, right, have we learned something? Yeah, we could have. Or could we have learned something? Yes, we could have. Right, we have at times, and some projects have. Because you know what? This storied history came as a result of somebody saying, we should learn and do something different. Right? It's okay. Right? We experiment. We have R&D. That's why we have forks. That's why we have common licenses. We clearly have a common set of values. We, the way that we choose to go and, and learn something, right? this is the one that, I mean, like, there's a bunch of reasons for this, but this particular one, I was around for a front row, with, with Dragonfly and, and FreeBSD. So that's R&D. That's experimentation. You know, it, so this, how, how can this potentially not be so hostile? Right? Where and why is it hostile? Sometimes it's in the kernel and that's the right thing to do. Sometimes it's in user land. Right? Maybe it doesn't need to be this way. Or maybe we can like, you know, start to think about the problem in a slightly different way and decompose this massive ball of software and then have overlapping communities. So what is progress, right? Well, I don't know. Like, we're kind of in this quagmire in the sense that like, we used to have a pluralistic base. We had Perl. It wasn't the base. We had utilities written in Perl. I go and look at, at Lumos right now, and some of their stuff is written in dtrace. Right? Like, like, they've modified it so that the print statements actually make it look like you know, normal commands. We have shell. Right? We've iterated and innovated on, on shell in the installer. That's kind of an interesting way to go do that. But there's other things outside of the base system. And because like, you know, we went to this point where we got rid of everything that wasn't C or shell, because we wanted everything to be self-bootstrap based off of the compiler in the base system. Okay, So everything not C or, sh or shell, get out of the car, you're not welcome, effectively. right? And if you're not C or shell, then you're not allowed in the base system. Your user land, your, your opinion about the base system is invalid because you didn't do it in the language of C or shell. right? I don't like your religion. Assembly too. There you go. <laughs> It's interesting now, like, like we're getting to the point where we're actually on this, this, this path to minimalism in the FreeBSD base, where we're taking bits and we're chucking it out to ports. Okay? Now at some point, I was really actually looking forward to having a conversation or hearing more about the state of, of, of packaging up base. Because most of base I actually don't care about and I want to turn off, right? If you ship me an operating system with SendMail or XNTPD, like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Right? I am so sick of that. It was one of the, like, it needs to go away. If you need NTP that's like high quality, go run that on your NTP server, but don't make that the default. Right? When was the last RCE on that? It was like five months ago? Right? Send mail? This is, this is crazy. I understand that there's a couple people that really, really, really want this, but it's not pragmatic, and it needs to be like punted so that people have control over this. Okay? And we're kind of on the trajectory, so like, we're not stuck in this situation. It's really interesting. So, okay, now next, next thought. If we're taking everything out of base and we're moving into ports, and we're building everything in Podria with a bootstrap system at this point in time, why am I stuck with C and Shell? So, maybe it's because of complexity. Right? At some point in the past, like building a distribution took an enormous amount of effort. There was a lot of complexity. The time to iteration was measured on, on the order of like hours to days. I used to like you know kick off a build world and go to bed and like you know maybe go to work and it would still be ticking in the following day, right? Okay, that no limit. Like this, you can build the world. Uh, we got it down to like eight minutes. Right? This is a pretty rapid development cycle, but like the API wasn't quite right at the time in the sense that like you couldn't quickly iterate. Oh, okay. But now you can. Like there's other projects that have done this and taken some of the best parts of FreeBSD, like you know Debian did it and Gentoo have done it. Rust BSD. Well, these were big projects for Debian and Gentoo. Like a lot of people and time and effort went into this. Rust BSD. I can do this in like five ten minutes. 
So we're going to get back. Like, let's use some modern tooling, and let's go and figure out how to do this, right? So in this case, and again, Packer, like, these are all open source. I keep referencing some of these things. Like, um, Packer's MPL v2 license, like, it's not going anywhere. Um, so in this case, we're going to go and spin up another image. This time, we're going to go and, and use Rust and Carg, and we're going to go and build this external user land. And this is actually a much more complete list of user land utilities. This particular author has done a really good job of putting together an actual, like a real compelling set of base utilities. And like the whole thing from soup to nuts takes like five minutes to be compiled to my local target architecture. No portability problems, right? It's specific to the OS version. I'm doing all of this work at image create time, not at runtime. Right? I'm not doing it at build time even in the sense that I'm not doing this at some like mythical dot or release. I'm doing this when I pulled down an operating system and I said I'm going to use this particular operating system for, for a, a given use case. And I go into and front load five minutes. Like this takes less time than running Chef or Puppet. Okay. And it's doing release, so this is like you know, dash O four thousand, like it's 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 optimized code. He goes and installs all this garbage. And I, in this case, I'm tossing it into user obj. And it finishes, and it works. Like, it just works. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but like, it's close enough to actually be usable. So I've got like a handful of my like, you know, regular like toy development FreeBSD boxes, and I'm just leaving this on. And it's okay. I need to start kicking some, some patches up, because like, some of these are like, I know, where, I know what I need to go to fix it, right? And I know this, this would be easy to go do. But I want to use this, these utilities elsewhere also. I don't want to have to go and be stuck in the past or using Solaris utilities, for instance, from you know, forever ago. Right? Why? Because it's part of the operating system. Nobody wants to touch it. Right? Maybe we can move away from that. Right? And some, oper some Unix operating systems, or only most Solaris operating systems have. Right? OmniOS went to a GNU user land, modern by and large. But it wasn't the BSD user land. They did it for feature flag reasons, compatibility of the user experience. Yeah? When you said architectures, do you mean ARM, ARM64, MIPS, RPC, it's totally important? It could be. I haven't, I'm, I, I don't touch any of the embedded and other platforms. And I'm not trying to diminish the value of having base utilities. Like, you can't you know, deorbit what's in base. But we can potentially like, begin to ask some questions about like what is the point of having some of these things and keeping them in the base in such a controlled way. There is an API to some of this stuff, but yeah. So from a portability perspective, it should, should like if like my experience has thus far been that if Rust, you have Rust support for that platform, this stuff will generally work. There's some operating system specific things um, where I had to, for instance, there's a um, uh, who is, no, who is, who, um, because struct UTMX or whatever it is, like there's some, you know, something that just hasn't been done that's, that's platform specific. Okay, fine, so we'll go address that. But like, if you look at kind of the other, like list of utilities that are here, like there are system specific calls that are in there, um, or platform specific calls that just work. Um, so, parting thoughts, uh, ish. So, we have this idea that it's okay to swap out the syscall based off of the running executable, right? We do this with the Linux Elevator. There's entire companies that built, built on FreeBSDs kernel at this point in time that make their money off of professionally, like commercially swapping out this syscall table to support different platforms. Lumos, we do that for Linux branded zones so that we can run Linux binaries on Lumos because Linux won the KPI war effectively, right? Just like we say JavaScript is the assembly of the web Linux binaries are effectively, you know, for better or worse, and I don't like a lot of it, but for better or worse, like that body of users basically won the kernel KPI war, right, such as it was. Like, and I think any of us really kind of understood that, that there could have been one or was one, but like now you're kind of looking back in history, you go, oh wow, like we're stuck with Linux for the next 50 years and it's KPI because it is 98, 99% of the market it feels like at times. So, so now we're really doing the big base systems, right? Like Linux actually did us a big disservice. Now, my turn to pick on them, um, because they did us a big service because they, for, because of packaging, because of Red Hat, because of Debian, whoever, they package core utils. 
the fuck is that? Right? It's a collection of loosely specified means something to a handful of people. Like, how do I go in and live in this pluralistic kind of world where I can have a utility, let's say, out of Rust, maybe a different one out of Go, and something out of the base system exists on the same box? I can't do that. So do we package every binary, each, each individual binary independently if it's a base operating system thing? Maybe, right? How do we version this? Right? We version every other single API in the world except for the user land. Right? People have kind of started, or started, people have tackled this and made half hearted attempts at this particular problem. Uh, but this is kind of a thing, and this is why we're so reticent to change, is because we can't version it, we don't version, and we haven't really put any thought into like how to make that a, a first class thing. Versioning of binaries is not a concern of operating systems, distributions, and releases. It probably needs to be. And this is why. Squatting on the file system is not okay. Squatting on the file system basically entitles you, because we have no versioning, to being the one canonical whatever. right? And it prevents collaboration between different projects and teams and, and groups of people that share the same kind of ethics and development practices. And I tell you what, between all of the BSDs and the Illumoses, and there's a group of people that want consistency regardless of the kernel they're running on. And right now, trying to share code between those groups is problematic. Modern building utilities make this trivial. Like, it's all done basically over the network, and there is no autoconf like, it's really, really nice world by comparison to CMake. Like none of that, none of the, none of the, none of that. I'm way done with it. So, and then this is, you know, a different one. What history? At this point in time, if you haven't patched from, you know, Intel's latest set of vulnerabilities, and you're running in a, in a cloud environment, I don't have a box up that I man directly manage over, you know, 90 days, but I want to get that down to seven days because I've decoupled my compute and my storage so I can run stateful applications. Heroku shoots their boxes, poison pill, every seven days. Nothing can have an uptime over seven days. So what history do you have? And a lot of us don't live in that world, right? If you're shipping something, you can't live in that world. But if you're running a server somewhere, you almost certainly can. And if you run a database that's got 20 terabytes of shared buffers or whatever it is, and you think you can't, you're wrong. Come talk to me. Okay? You can do this with live migration. You can do this with caching of the page tables, um, that, that are, you know, the shared buffers. There's a bunch of tricks and tactics and ways of doing this. Living in this world so that we don't think that three years of an uptime is a good thing, is a good thing. Like, we want to get that down to, like, you know, tiny, tiny values. The thing that matters is the application that's running, not necessarily the operating system. And that's a big shift for the community. Do we need tight coupling? You need that bin locate example, or that, that, that uh, periodic locate. Yeah, we actually do need coupling between the base system that goes and uh, does, you know, like fans out as a series of shell script to go and walk the file system. Yeah, we do need coupling between that and head, who knew, right? I thought that was like, just incredible. But we do. And so when we do, you need to depend on a specific package because we are moving to a package world. So like periodic locate would be a package that would depend on BSD head until there was like options and choice there. And yeah, can we embrace plurality? Because like there is interesting work here. Like somebody wrote versions of grep in Rust that outperform grep. We should not assume that what we have in tree is sacrosanct and the correct, most performant thing. Right? We've known that for a while. We say that about you know GNU awk versus R awk. Right? Maybe that got flipped around at some point, or GNU grep versus R grep. So we kind of like already had chinks in the armor in terms of our argument that suggested that maybe there's other things that are happening in these user lane utilities that we couldn't, didn't, or weren't capable of packaging and bringing into base. But maybe we were to the point now where we can. There's other operating systems that have just carte blanche changed their user land. It's an okay thing, right? There's value to some of this stuff. It's all slightly different, though. That's maddening because if you're at the top of your make file, you have to go like you know, um, which redirect def no like gmake make and like three other things in order to get the consistent calling convention. That sucks. And really, nuke and pave. 
figure out how to get your application so that you can move to this rolling world. There's a bunch of benefits because that if you're doing something like this where you're able to like nuke and pave, then you're probably in a world where you have self-healing systems and your uptimes are going to be better. Your, your response at machine time is better than human time. Not to say that we don't need to go in and, you know, pop the hatch and, and like page out to meet space so that we can go in and investigate. But you want to keep that to a minimum because, I don't know about you, I like sleeping or not being at work sometimes. So, last bit, right? Basically, licensed software gives you access to like-minded people. We have a bunch of like-minded people here across three different projects. There's more of us. We don't really share a whole lot in the way of user land, and sometimes we do, and it's only like one or two people because like, it's a pet project because of access. Because of packaging and ports, this now starts to open up and becomes really interesting. I'm just going to let that sink. And then, uh, yeah, last one, I guess, because this is also something I keep bringing up. So we've been at this for a long time. Uh, if you took, if you had perfect clairvoyance and foresight and you were able to think into the future and project in the future and say, you know, I want our ideal situation to be something, and is, it, and is that ideal thing in the future different than what we're doing now? And if it is, how do we make that, how do we plan the path to execution so that we can live in kind of our ideal world? So I don't think anybody's like terribly happy about some of this stuff. And it's just a common theme, like just because we have history and we agree on history doesn't mean we have to live in the past. There's my slides. Those are all post uh, in the next handful of minutes. Um, who did I offend? <laughs> Questions? Go ahead. <laughs> Very possible. My workload and my experiences in deployment of servers and computer infrastructure is not the same. Like that's why I said up front, there's like, you know, what's your perspective, right? Um, and so I, I'd be actually very interested in learning because apparently I have more to learn because I have, think I have a decent understanding of how a lot of this stuff does uh, it works because I've done some embedded stuff and other. But there's clearly more for me to learn. There's more for all of us to learn. That's kind of the point. <laughs> Yeah. Um, a FreeBSD user, yep. OpenBSD user, one of the things I love most about OpenBSD and the reason I will use mm -hmm. it is it doesn't change. Yep. Or it changes very, very slowly in a very controlled manner yep. with lots of lead time for good reasons. Some, that, for good reasons. Yeah. That may be. But I mean, up to this point in time, you can largely say the same thing about FreeBSD or NBSD or really almost any Linux mm -hmm. is the whole point the whole point of we're living in, we're living with all that legacy mm -hmm. baggage um, is why Unix is so commercially successful in my neck of the woods against, say, Windows servers where they change everything with every release. Correct. But they change everything with every freaking update. Well, <laughs> yeah, I don't want change for the sake of change. I don't want that either. <laughs> That's not what I'm arguing for. I understand that, right? I'm not trying to say, and I was not trying to point out that there is something that's out there that has feature parity with BSD or OpenBSD, right? It is a change. But the change is being brought about and or facilitated, and it's not changed because it hasn't landed anywhere in, in that regard, right? Like this is all things that I did use land using existing base OS, right? shares interactive and, and, and you know there's lots of us that actually think in born shell that you get really confused when you type for i and something and it says it doesn't work I'm like, oh yeah that's defaulted to c shell for some <laughs> but right. the, you're sharing a language with an, with a, with an interactive session and then and so that like if you look at languages you look at what python has done to avoid changing 2.7 mm -hmm. even in the relatively minor ways that, you know, you have, say, the competing thought, like PHP or Perl, mm -hmm. which often have gigantic compatibility issues, version on version. Those are largely scripting languages as well. And the static analysis on that 
entire universe is poor. So there's a bunch of reasons. There's a bunch of reasons. I'm going to go to a couple. There's somebody up here that had. Go ahead. The embedded environment, from what I've experienced, rips out most of the user land, keeps only what they have because of space constraints. And so they have very tight controls on what goes into the actual product. Yep. 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 Yes. You mean package, the package thing? Yes. Oh, for sure. I'm sorry. Yes. I th yes. I, when I use that, when I, you know, embedded, I'm thinking, I was thinking like, you know, uh, HDMI cables, like, you know, on the way micro side, as opposed to maybe appliances. And there's a spectrum there. I'm grabbing really large course terms. Questions? All right. Well, I'm done early. We're good. And happy to bike shed more later. <laughs>